this is something that I think is, is a really important issue. I think we're in no doubt that food really matters in, in so many different ways. Uh, in fact, nothing has, no human activity anyway, has a bigger influence on the surface of the planet than the way we produce our food. Uh, historically, it's changed more of, of the planet and is continuing to do so. Uh, and of course, it also affects the oceans as well as the land. So it's, it's a tremendously important issue for us to address. But in general, we've not thought of it really as an ethical issue, certainly not in, in this culture. Um, other religions do have strictures on what you can eat and what you can't, but uh, the, the tradition of, uh, of the Christian society anyway um, has really not been to see that as a central ethical issue, with the exception perhaps of the issue of gluttony, which is one of the, the key sins, but otherwise um, food is really, is, is really open. And that makes it a contrast to other issues that we straightforwardly do think of as ethical issues. Um, obviously sex, um, things about honesty, uh, and so on. And so when we think of ethics, if we think of ethics in public life, those are the kinds of things that come to mind. It's easy to think of a political career or two that's been severely damaged by revelations about sexual ethics, um, also perhaps about ethics in, in taking money, not so easy to think of one that's been affected by ethical issues about what a person has eaten. So um, I think we do need to, to, to focus on ethics in relation to food and look at the important ways in which we make choices when we eat and how those choices affect, uh, as I said, the surface of the planet, uh, the environment uh, in many different ways, uh, but also, of course, um, it affects uh, billions of animals. In fact, about 10 billion land animals in this country alone killed every year, plus untold billions of uh, marine or aquatic animals. Uh, and uh, undoubtedly, it affects uh, the workers in the industry as well. So that's really what this conference is going to be talking about, this, this range of issues. And uh, what I want to do is to give you a very brief uh, overview of some of those issues, which I'm sure speakers will address more fully um, after me and all day tomorrow. When I say a very brief overview, though, I, I'm in the unusual position of being a little uncertain at this stage as to how long I'm to speak for, despite the fact that I've organized uh, the session. The reason for that is that uh, Eric Schlosser uh, uh, had an interview related to the release of the movie Fast Food Nation um, in New York this afternoon and is currently in a car on his way down. Um, we believe that he's uh, closing in on us and will be here very shortly, but um, obviously if he's not, I'm going to have to speak to keep talking. So um, let, me, let me begin, and uh, uh, um, if I start slowly and speed up, it's a good sign, I guess. <laughs> okay, so if we ask the question, what should we eat, um, here are some of the choices that we might consider. So most people in this country eat what is sometimes called the standard American diet. Um, I'm sure you all know what that is. It's a diet that's heavy in animal products, and most of these animal products come from concentrated animal feeding operations, uh, CAFOs, as they're sometimes called, in popular parlance, factory farms. And this is a, a dramatic change from traditional agriculture, because traditionally, when we ate animals, those animals had been outgrazing or in some way gathering food that we either could not or would not gather and eat. So uh, cattle, a classic example, cattle were out eating grass. We can't eat grass, we can't digest it, but they can. So when they go out and eat grass, they add to the availability of food for us that we could not otherwise have. Similarly, if you have um, hens pecking around the farmyard, they'll pick up little grains and seeds that we wouldn't bother collecting. They'll catch insects that we wouldn't want to eat. Um, and so they add to the food supply in that way. But the revolution in uh, animal industry over the last 50 years has taken animals away from the field, 
uh, not absolutely entirely, but largely, and concentrated them in these feeding operations where we then have to grow the food that they eat, basically grains or soybeans. And when we do that, we have to use our agricultural land to grow crops that we could directly eat in order to feed it into animals. So there are many environmental questions about that, which I will come to um, shortly. So that's, that's one choice, and that is the choice that most Americans are making today, and that includes largely Princeton students. So that's, you know, we want to look at the large world picture and the American picture in this conference, but we also want to focus in towards the end on what are we eating at Princeton and can we improve that? Can we make more ethical choices here at Princeton? So other options would be to get organically produced food, and I'll talk about all of these in a little more detail, vegetarian, not eating meat, vegan, not consuming any animal products, and then cross-cutting with all of these issues, there are other questions you can ask, such as should we be trying to buy locally produced food? Um, should we be getting fair trade food? What does that exactly mean? Or just at the end, I'll throw out as a thought, I'm not really going to talk about that, um, are we eating too much and should we be trying to, to cut down on that? Okay, so let's look at the way we produce these foods today and particularly I'll start focusing on the animal foods. So here's a quote which significantly is not from someone, say, in the animal rights movement, but is from a professor of animal science at Oregon State University, Peter Cheek, who's the author of a well-known textbook on animal agriculture, and whose students basically are people who are going into animal agriculture, or in, certainly into agriculture in general, and many of them into animal agriculture. So this is, this is not um, someone who you would expect to take a hostile view of the animal industry. And yet he is concerned about the fact that we, we, that is the general public generally, do not know very much about how our food is produced. And he suggests here that there's a reason for that, um, and the reason is that people generally would not like to know sorry, would not like the way their food is produced, and it might therefore have a negative effect on them eating it. And when uh, Jim Mason and I did research for the book that uh, Kathy just mentioned in introducing me, The Way We Eat, we found that, uh, this indeed was true, that um, we could not get in to see these uh, CAFOs, these uh, factory farms. 30 years ago, um, when I was researching my book, Animal Liberation, this was not the case. Um, then I was simply able to contact uh, farmers in uh, the neighbourhood. I was doing research in New York and I was able to say, look, I'm interested in new methods of animal agriculture, um, so uh, could, I come and, could I come and look at uh, the way you're producing food? And, and people were very open and, and uh, I was able to see what was going on. Now they've definitely closed up and you could say, well, that's because of the rise of the animal rights movement. They're, they're worried about criticism. But it's not only to people in the animal rights movement that they're closed. I've talked to many journalists who also have this problem. Um, so I think that there is an inherent problem there. If Americans are every day eating products where the producers are reluctant to let them see how those products are being made. However, in fact, um, it's impossible, of course, to really preserve secrecy on these things. And we do have quite a lot of video footage and photographs taken from inside modern uh, factory farms. And I'm just going to show you a few of those. Um, uh, if you want to look at it in more detail, as I say, there are videos on, on many websites that you can look at. I didn't want to um, give you a, a, a video. I'm not uh, out here to to uh, shock you or horrify you, but I just think that we need to know a little bit about where these come from. So um, uh, Eric Schlosser, of course, uh, famously wrote about uh, beef in particular, um, uh, the focus uh, in fast food nation um, as uh, the, the standard fast food, although there's, there is information certainly in that book about uh, other fast foods. And this is a standard beef 
feedlot, so this is the confined animal feeding operation for beef cattle, they're vast, um, they have enormous numbers of cattle, they require enormous quantities of, of grain to feed these cattle, um, and of course, as you can imagine, they have enormous manure problems. So feedlots like this, good to see you, Eric. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> feedlots like this um, are, uh, un are, are producing the, the, the kind of uh, effluent, the kind of manure problems that uh, substantial size cities produce. Okay, let me move through briefly some of these uh, other uh, factory farm conditions. Uh, Peter Cheek talked about uh, chicken. So here's a broiler chicken unit. Um, very, very crowded. Uh, birds are always inside these sheds in flocks of uh, 20, 20 to 30,000 birds, um, never going outside. Um, they're really very young birds and they grow so fast that, in fact, their legs sometimes can't support their weight. But there's no individual attention to these birds. Um, they are um, basically not worth that. So if their legs collapse under them and they're not near a feeding unit or a water unit, they will simply die. They will die of, of thirst or, or starve. And somebody may walk through the shed and, and pick up the corpses and get rid of them every now and again. But that's all that will happen. There's another shot from the, uh, the bird's eye view, you might say. Um, and that's the killing line that, uh, again, I, I won't go into details now, but um, uh, chickens are not legally required to be stunned before being killed. So there's something like nine billion chickens killed each year in this country. Um, so, you know, work that out. I think it works out to about two million in the time of this session that we're going to have alone. Um, and uh, although they get an electric shock, the evidence is that it does not actually make them unconscious. It merely paralyzes them to hold them still before being killed. Uh, now, since Thanksgiving has come up, I thought I'd show you some turkeys. Um, equally crowded, the standard, this is, you know, 99% of the turkey production in this country, or 99 point something, um, unless you get some free range turkey, of which a few exist. The other interesting fact about turkeys, which makes a great uh, family conversation topic around the table at Thanksgiving, it, is that every one of these birds is the result of artificial insemination. We have bred turkeys that cannot mate because the male's breasts are so large they physically cannot perform the act. So there are people, lots of them in this country, whose job it is, day in, day out, to masturbate male turkeys, obtain the semen from them, and someone else whose job it is then to put that into the female, which is a pretty rough and ready procedure, I have to say. My, uh, my co-author, Jim Mason, worked at it for a day or two, found it, uh, just to see what it was like, found it was the dirtiest, hardest day's work he'd ever done. Um, but that's, that's the nature of the industry and the birds we've produced. Uh, veal calves, you probably already know about. I would think um, audiences come to this know the problems of confined veal, a pale, anemic flesh produced from animals basically standing still all their lives. Um, but pig production is pretty much as bad, especially for the breeding sows, which you see here, also confined so that they can't walk around. They're in these uh, crates their entire pregnancy, about 16 weeks, um, never really being able to walk. That's another crate. On concrete with no straw, as you see, no bedding. Uh, that's how they're confined when they're with their piglets, again, really unable to move. Um, that's the piglets uh, being reared. Uh, this is egg production uh, in cages, even more closely confined than the meat chickens. Uh, you see there again. But the good news is that there is an alternative if we want to see it. Um, sorry, before I show you the alternative, uh, the hens in the cages have their beaks cut off because otherwise the more ag aggressive birds will actually kill the, the weaker birds. Um, so instead of treating the symptoms, the stress and the overcrowding that cause this, they simply trim back the beak so that the beak is too blunt to actually inflict serious injury on the other hen. Um, one alternative is organic eggs. Uh, this is a major organic producer in the northeast. No cages, um, better conditions definitely, but still very crowded. Although the organic rules appear to say that the birds should be able to go outside, uh, in practice for much of the year they don't go outside and the producer here was quite open in saying that he didn't really want them outside because he was worried that uh, wild birds overhead might uh, uh, leave their droppings in the outside run and they could get avian influenza, bird flu, from that. 
Um, so they're largely inside, although many experts say that that's actually a better condition for, for growing uh, bird flu um, than the natural conditions outside. Now, the alternative to that is much better, and that's one, here's one just down the road here, Cherry Grove Farm, Lawrenceville, New Jersey. Um, it's a small-scale production, only a few hundred hens, um, but uh, you can see that they have plenty of space. They do the things that hens like to do, add in the grass, pecking it at grass and insects and so on. So there is that alternative. Yes, the eggs will be more expensive. Um, yes, it will be perhaps difficult to produce the number of eggs we produce in this country, but um, there are possibilities. Similarly, instead of the feedlot, you can keep your cows on grass um, the entire time, keep the cows with their mothers the entire time. It, it can be done, um, and it's clearly much better for the animals and also much better for uh, the environment in various ways. Okay, here are some seals that uh, indicate some better animal welfare standards if you're looking for that. Um, we could discuss, but I, I don't have time, the actual details of the standard. Um, and here's the big environmental point about factory farming. 70% of the grain we grow is fed to animals and we get back only one pound of meat, meat protein uh, on average for every six pounds that we put in. So that produces more stress on the environment in a variety of ways. Uh, that's a table showing similarly how the plant products are much more efficient in their yield per acre than the milk and meat and eggs that you get down in the, the smaller columns. So as um, Vaclav Smil, who's an authority on, on feeding the world, says, we inevitably get less food when we feed it crops to animals. And in fact, to give everyone in the world as much meat as people in the affluent world need, we'd require two-thirds more agricultural land than the world actually possesses, an obvious impossibility. Uh, climate change, we're going to hear more about um, from two of our speakers, Gideon Nichelle and Pamela Martin, tomorrow. Um, makes a big difference because of all the energy that goes into this grain-fed meat if we uh, eat less meat, whether or not we go completely vegan, eating less meat um, is always a step in the right direction. Manure problems, this is a huge pig factory. In fact, you see a series of different factories all in part of the same unit there. Um, enormous, these are euphemistically called lagoons, um, not exactly what you think of when you think of coral islands and their lagoons. They're basically cesspools, that's a close-up, they're just liquid manure. Um, and uh, uh, every now and again they spill with heavy rain and pollute the rivers or groundwaters. Um, and even if they don't, often the manure is then sprayed on surrounding fields, but because it's costly to move, um, they uh, are spraying it too thickly on the fields nearby and it still gets into the rivers and groundwaters. Uh, definitions of organic foods set by USDA, certainly better for the environment with the lack of synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, uh, no GM plants or animals, no uh, antibiotics, steroids or hormones. And as I said, in theory, they should be able to go outside, but in practice, they don't always. Here's another example, milk unit. This is the way Aurora Organic Dairy advertises its products. See the cows out on the grass. This is an aerial shot of what the dairy looks like. It's near, uh, not too far from Denver. Um, actually, no grass at all there. The cows do get to go outside, but just on densely populated dirt areas where grass can't grow. And in fact, when you ask Aurora, they say, well, they're on grass when they're not giving milk, which is a very small part of the cow's life. Uh, okay, I won't go into that for time reason. Uh, issues about local food, we're going to be talking about tomorrow. Gary Nabhans, who's written a book on that, will be discussing those issues. Fair trade, um, we have increasing ranges of fair trade products. We need to ask, can we help independent growers in developing countries? Uh, with fair trade products and how does that system work. In Europe, particularly in the UK, we've got much more awareness of fair trade than we do here. This shows the recognition of the fair trade mark, which in 2005 reached 50% recognition and understanding of what the mark means in Britain. Uh, I wouldn't really like to hazard a guess at how great recognition of the fair trade mark is in this country, but you can be sure that it's nowhere near the British level which is a pity, but maybe we'll catch up. Um, maybe universities like this one can help to catch up. And uh, increasing sales of fair trade products too. And note that it's not only coffee and hot beverages. That's the bottom green 
section of these columns, but increasingly it's um, uh, confectionery and snacks and fruits and juices as well. Well, so we can ask, what can we do? What can we personally do? What can we do through setting an example? Because eating is a, a public act generally, it's something we do with people, and we can talk about it and um, help to spread the idea that it's an ethical issue. What can we do here at Princeton as an institution um, to do more to make ethical choices? So let me conclude with a couple of, of suggestions as to what we can do. So the highest priority, I believe, is to avoid products from CAFOs, from factory farms. And that's because they are so bad, both in environmental terms, um, because of the added stress they put on the environment in so many different ways. I haven't been able to go into the details of it, but hopefully we'll get more of that uh, tomorrow. Um, and also because of the very serious animal welfare concerns. Whatever you think about questions about the fundamental moral status of animals, whether you think that uh, we have a right to eat them and to kill them for our food or not, um, I think most people will agree that they ought to be able to have a decent life before they end up on our plate, if they are to end up on our plate at all. And the, the big animal welfare issue with factory farming is that essentially they don't. The whole system is geared around producing their flesh, milk or eggs as cheaply as possibly can and as long as they live and continue to uh, put on weight or produce eggs, that system will be used. Producers will sometimes try and tell you that um, if they're putting on weight or laying eggs, they can't be discontented. But that's simply not true. And in fact, you can find quotes in journals in the agricultural industry itself showing that sometimes the economics mean that you should crowd more chickens into your shed or more hens into your cages, even if each individual bird can be shown to be doing less well because of the crowding. More of them die or they lay fewer eggs per bird. But the economics aren't geared to per bird, they're geared to the total production unit. And that is often at odds with the maximising of productivity of the animals, even if we were prepared to accept that that was a guide to welfare. So I think that's the, the highest priority that we should have. But it's also important to think about um, whether we can make more ethical choices. I've suggested um, by going vegetarian or vegan, we not only resolve issues about the moral status of animals in, in a fairly clear-cut way, but we also reduce our responsibility for greenhouse gas emissions and for various other forms of pollution. But we can also be a conscientious omnivore, buying from farms like the one I showed you, Cherry Grove in Lawrenceville, and others which really do have an ethic of treating their animals well and being sustainable in their environment. And we can certainly buy organic. I think it's generally better to, uh, preferable to conventional. But we do have to be aware of attempts to stretch the criteria, um, as in the dairy farm I showed you, as um, perhaps uh, arguably as Walmarts are now doing as they move into organics. It's, it's great that organics are going mainstream, but just yesterday the Washington Post carried a story of a lawsuit filed against Walmart saying that they had lumped products which were simply labelled natural but did not meet organic criteria in a cabinet with overall organic labels. And the word natural in current US uh, usage is totally meaningless. Um, factory farm products can be labelled natural. There's no, there's no criteria set for what is natural, um, so uh, it doesn't mean anything, but it's possible to mislead consumers into thinking they're getting an organic product with that label. Uh, and finally, <clears throat> um, more complicated issues which would really take more time to discuss, I think, uh, yes, buying locally is certainly better, but it's important then to think about whether you're buying seasonally because locally produced tomatoes in May or June, say, were almost certainly grown with artificial heat and the fossil fuel that you're saving by not trucking them up from Florida was probably burned up to keep the greenhouse warm. So you do have to be a bit careful about that. On the, and on the other hand, I think we do want to support agriculture in developing countries, especially if it's fairly traded, but we have to be aware of the 
fuel costs of transport, especially by air. If it's come by ship, not so bad because shipping is a pretty efficient way of moving goods around. It doesn't use so much fossil fuel. But air is um, much more of a contributor to greenhouse gases. And certainly we should be favouring small independent farms uh, where we can um, rather than being part of the larger corporate agribusiness system with a whole range of, of problems, including the ones I've talked about, but some that I know Eric Schlosser is going to be talking about in a moment. So um, let me leave my remarks at that. It's um, my very pleasant duty now to introduce Eric Schlosser to you. Um, Eric Schlosser is a, a Princeton graduate, class of 81, and uh, he was telling me uh, yesterday when we were able to chat a bit that um, although perhaps he didn't recognise it during his years at Princeton, later on looking back he's realised that it was the education he got at Princeton that made it possible for him to do the things that he's done in terms of, of writing and uh, inspiration for, for going into journalism and the kind of journalism that he has written. So I think that's a, a useful lesson for, for undergraduates here. Um, you may not always realise at the time uh, how important the education is and what some of the classes are, are doing for you. Um, obviously, famously, um, uh, Eric Schlosser, after uh, working in the film industry a bit and, and writing for the Atlantic Monthly, went on to write uh, Fast Food Nation, which became a huge bestseller and has now been made, well, I don't know whether made into is quite the right word, but there is a movie uh, that is opening tomorrow called uh, Fast Food Nation, which uh, is, is loosely based uh, around the book. It's not a documentary. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's a narrative of some people in the industry, um, but I do recommend that you see it. I think it's, it's uh, interesting, challenging, but sometimes also entertaining um, viewing. And uh, so we're fortunate that Eric is able to, to take some time out of that really busy schedule in uh, promoting uh, this film, which is, is about to be released, and, and talk to us. I should also mention that he's the, the co-author uh, of a book called Chew on This, which is uh, also talking about, the, uh, about food aimed at a, a younger audience, at a teenage audience, and that's um, been recently released. And uh, um, there are a number of, of other books that he's written about, about um, uh, the drug industry and, and so on. Um, but I'm sure you're all more eager to hear Eric Schlosser talking uh, about the question of, of food and ethics and uh, moving beyond fast food nation than you are to hear me. So I'm going to introduce Eric. We will have some time for discussion and Q&A when he's over. Eric Schlosser, very welcome. Well, thank you. Um, I want to thank Professor Singer and the Princeton Environmental Institute for having me here. And um, it's very wild for me to be standing here. Uh, as I walked into this building, I realized that the last time I was in here was for a Talking Heads concert. <laughs> and it was not only a very different event, but that really dates how long it's been since I've been in here. Uh, it's really encouraging to see how many people are here this evening. And to me, uh, the success of this conference, and Professor Singer was telling me yesterday about how the size of the hall kept on getting bigger and bigger. Uh, to me, it's a sign that there is now a movement, a real movement uh, on the issue of food and the ethical and the social implications of food. And I hope um, that we can all recognize that people like Professor Singer and Wendell Berry um, and uh, Francis Moore LePay, who were writing about this 20, 25, 30 years ago, really were the pioneers in a movement that is now reaching a critical mass. So today I'm going to talk about um, ethics and our food system and the fast food nation that we've created. And it's interesting to me that on college campuses, where there seems to be a great deal of political apathy on many issues, there seems also to be a great interest in food issues. Uh, food is something, and the food system is something that we not only have contact with three times a day, 
but it's something that we can each do something about at a time where our political process seems so corrupted and uh, both political parties seem to be so in throes of large corporations. Food is something you can change and this food system is something that you apparently can change with every bite. So, today I'm going to talk about some of the problems we face. That is, the recent industrialization of livestock and of agriculture. I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of this system, the nature of its system, what is driving it in my view, some of the impacts of it, and the high cost ultimately of this cheap food. And I'm going to end by suggesting maybe what we can do about it because I'm, at, I'm very optimistic about the possibility of change. And just in the last, it's almost six years now since Fast Food Nation came out, I've seen tremendous change on, the, on this subject and I think there's much more to come. But what's crucial, crucial to understand is that the food we eat has changed more, I would argue, in the last 30 years than in the previous 30 years. Thousand. There has just been a profound change in what we eat. Some of those pictures showed how our food is produced. And you look at hormones and the, the widespread use of hormones uh, in, in, among livestock, antibiotics, uh, these factory farms, genetic engineering. These really are the result of the last three decades. And I think these changes have, been, have occurred so swiftly and so easily because most Americans don't know anything about them. The food that we eat looks the same. It looks fundamentally unchanged, but it's a different thing. This food has never been eaten before by human beings. Uh, even the Chicken McNugget is a new thing. Uh, the Chicken McNugget was invented, I think, in 1983. So it's only been around for 20 years, and somehow, somehow, mankind fed itself for millennia without it, <laughs> which makes me optimistic about the future. So let me talk about the origins of this heavily industrialized agriculture that we have. Well, there were huge changes in agriculture in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, mechanization, the replacement of horse-drawn plows with, by tractors, and more significantly in many ways, the introduction of synthetic fertilizers. This resulted in huge increases in crop yields, in efficiency, also in farm size uh, in the first half of the 20th century. And some of the problems of this sort of industrialization were being pointed out as early as the 1920s and the 1930s. There was a growing movement against this industrialization the birth of the modern organic movement actually occurred before the Second World War, but these visionaries really were not heard as the march of progress went forward. Uh, the worst environmental impact of this pre-Second World War industrialized agriculture in this country, I would argue, would be the terrible, terrible soil conservation uh, that led to the Dust Bowl of the 1930s and the displacement of tens of thousands of farmers and widespread migration from the land. But the really big changes happened after the Second World War. And we can thank uh, many of the German chemical companies uh, that uh, during the Nazi era were doing high-tech research in chemical warfare because some of the products that they developed to kill people were later applied to the land. Uh, to kill pests of various kinds. And it's right after the Second World War that the chemical industry gives us all of these new herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides that came out of that World War II research. And Rachel Carson, 40 years ago in Silent Spring, wrote about some of the impacts of those industrial products on the environment. Uh, but there was another important change after the Second World War that I think didn't get enough attention. It took a long time for people to realize the impact of that change, the impact on the land, on animals, and on human beings. And this system was not born in Nazi Germany, uh, but in San Bernardino, California, small town in Southern California. And that is where, in 1948, the McDonald brothers came up with a new way of preparing food. 
a new way of making hamburgers at their one little restaurant, and their great innovation was to bring the factory system into a restaurant. It was the first application of this uh, system to the preparation of restaurant food. And it's very important that it happened there at that time and in that place because Southern California in the post-war era truly was the laboratory for the future. And what happened in Southern California, the culture that emerged there had a profound impact not only on American culture but on the rest of the world and how it developed. Uh, Los Angeles was the first modern city formed by the automobile and by the needs of the automobile. And Los Angeles in the post-war era was also the heart of the U.S. aerospace industry. And the culture that emerged in Southern California in those years was a culture that blindly worshipped science and technology. There was a cult of science. There was a belief truly in better living through chemistry. It just so happened that the great propagandist of science was there at the same time. And I'm talking about Walt Disney, who took this worship of technology and greatly spread it to the masses. This whole notion of a, a great, big, beautiful tomorrow through nicer kitchen appliances. Uh, one of Disney's most popular uh, post-war documentaries was called Our Friend the Atom. It was a documentary in favor of all kinds of uses of nuclear power. It was hosted by a former Nazi scientist who'd done experiments on human beings at Dachau, but Disney didn't mention that fact. In this Disney version of the future, we would all be driving nuclear-powered cars, we would live in plastic houses, and this faith was sincere. Now, the fast food industry of Southern California, McDonald's, came out of that culture, and it was imbued with those values. Some of those values at the core of the fast food culture, speed, efficiency, cheapness, the application of technology towards food. Now, Ray Kroc, who visited the McDonald Brothers uh, restaurant, he was a milkshake salesman, he visited this restaurant and had a vision of one McDonald's at every busy intersection across the United States. Kroc took over the company from the brothers, he drove the brothers out of business, and he brought two other ideas and ideals uh, to the heart of the fast food culture that was emerging. Those would be uniformity and conformity, uh, values also at the heart of the factory system. And I'm going to read you a quote from Ray Kroc that I think tells you a great deal about this culture and the impact it would have not only on this country but on the rest of the world. So this is the founder of the McDonald's Corporation, Ray Kroc. Quote, we have found out that we cannot trust some people who are nonconformists. We will make conformists out of them in a hurry. The organization cannot trust the individual. The individual must trust the organization. The system that Kroc laid down for McDonald's was all about uniformity, conformity, and centralized control of production. And the key to the success of McDonald's as it spread was its ability to serve the same food that tasted the same way and was made the same way at thousands of identical locations. And this has had a profound impact on our food system in a very brief period of time. Now, when there were just a handful of McDonald's in the 1950s, it really didn't have a big impact on how food is produced in the United States. And as recently as 1968, which was 20 years after the creation of McDonald's, there were only a thousand McDonald's restaurants. And in a country of this size, having a thousand restaurants doesn't change how food is produced. Well, today, uh, there are 30,000 McDonald's restaurants, about half of them in the United States. And today, McDonald's is the largest purchaser of beef in the United States and the largest purchaser of pork and of chicken and of potatoes. These are the staples of the American diet. It's also now the largest purchaser of lettuce 
and even of apples in the United States. And McDonald's has a worldwide impact. McDonald's is the biggest purchaser of agricultural products in France, an unexpected place for it to have this kind of power. Now, their needs have largely determined how these foods are produced, whether they're sold at McDonald's or not, because of this is the biggest purchaser. And McDonald's has pushed centralization, concentration, and industrialization in every one of these markets, for every one of these commodities. Again, its need, speed, efficiency, cheapness, uniformity, conformity. Uh, and it really pushed the application of a factory system and factory values toward the production of livestock. In particular, those photographs you saw, those things didn't exist 35 to 45 years ago, those factory farms. Uh, when McDonald's was uh, in its early stages in the 1960s, McDonald's bought fresh ground beef from 175 different meat suppliers throughout the United States. But as it decided to grow and grow quickly in the 1970s, it switched from fresh ground beef to frozen ground beef. It cut back from 175 suppliers to only five suppliers. And it wanted a product of ground beef that was uniform, that tasted everywhere the, exactly the same. And McDonald's really, really played a large role in the consolidation of the meatpacking industry in the United States. In the early 1970s, there were thousands of slaughterhouses in this country. Today, there are 13 slaughterhouses that process the majority of the beef consumed by 300 million people. 13 buildings, really, really big buildings. And these meatpacking companies got bigger and bigger. Uh, in the 1970s, the top four, early 1970s, the top four meatpacking companies controlled about 20% of the market for beef. Today, the top four meatpacking companies control 80 to 85% of the market for beef. Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle 100 years ago. 100 years ago, he attacked the Beef Trust. Uh, the Beef Trust controlled a smaller proportion of the market for beef than these top four companies do today. So we have never had as centralized and industrialized a meat system in our history. And one of these companies, Tyson Foods, uh, which is the biggest purchaser, the biggest producer, I'm sorry, of beef, and the biggest producer of chicken, and the second biggest producer of pork, is the largest meatpacking company in the history of the world. There's never been a company like it. And these factory farms primarily were created to serve McDonald's and the other fast food chains. But now, that is the mainstream meat system that we have. You saw uh, that feedlot. Well, we now have feedlots with up to 125,000 cattle in a feedlot. Uh, we've never raised cattle that way before. And we've eaten beef for thousands of years. Uh, we have poultry houses with tens of thousands of chicken uh, that will never see the outdoors except on the day they are born and on the day that they die. Uh, we have hogs that have been bred to be uniform in size, again, uniformity. Uh, this helps in the slaughterhouse so more machines can efficiently slaughter the hogs. They have been bred to be uniform and lean and cheap. Uh, by being bred this way, many of these hogs are now unable to survive in the outdoors. Uh, they are living indoors, again, from the day they are born until the day they are about to be slaughtered. These animals are crammed incredibly closely together. And when you cram animals like this closely together and they are living in, their, in one another's filth, they are much more prone to become sick. So antibiotics are now being routinely given uh, to these animals, both to prevent them from, being, uh, from getting sick and because through some mysterious process, uh, these animals given antibiotics grow a little bit faster. Uh, the overwhelming majority of antibiotics in the United States are not being given uh, to children for their ear infections or to you for uh, your infections. The overwhelming majority of antibiotics are being given to livestock, primarily to make them grow faster. Uh, anabolic steroids, it's remarkable. If you're a, if you're a cyclist and you take uh, steroids, you are disqualified from the Tour de France. 
uh, but some of the very same steroids that are being abused uh, by athletes. And you look at the DEA website, and it talks about all the dangers of steroid use and all the ways it could harm your body. Well, the very same steroids that are illegal for athletic competitions are being routinely given to almost all of the cattle in the United States. These steroids, these anabolic steroids are, are implanted in their ear. They make, the, uh, they make them grow just a little bit faster. Um, but it's a little unnerving that if you're a person, you can't take these things, but it's just fine to eat the meat from animals who have been given massive amounts of them. So animals have been transformed fundamentally into industrial commodities. This system is taking sentient creatures and turning them into commodities and using very, very narrow economic measures of efficiency in their production. Uh, but human beings have also been changed, I would argue, by the system uh, into disposable and interchangeable parts. Uh, one of the great uh, innovations of McDonald's was instead of having trained cooks in the restaurant, they broke all of the tasks in the kitchen down uh, so that one worker did the same thing again and again and again, like the old factory system of the late 19th century. And by having workers who were not actually skilled, they could be paid a very low wage. And in the meatpacking plants of the United States, these mega slaughterhouses have done the same thing, uh, turning workers essentially into automatons who are doing the task the same way again and again thousands of times in one day. Uh, the values that have led human beings and animals to be treated this way are very simple. Cheapness, efficiency, speed, uniformity, conformity. Everything the same, everywhere the same. And McDonald's uh, had a corporate slogan a few years ago that I think is very revealing and also very chilling. This was the McDonald's slogan. Quote, one taste world wide, unquote. That is the goal, that is the system that has triumphed in this country in the last 30 years. So, what have some of the impacts of this system been? Well, this cheap fast food has proven remarkably profitable for a handful of fast food companies, for their major agribusiness suppliers. But it has proven terribly costly to society as a whole. Uh, the first, let me talk first about some of the images we saw about the livestock. Uh, I think that this system fundamentally mistreats animals. Uh, these creatures were never, never, uh, did not evolve evolutionally, in an evolutionary sense, to live in their own filth. As a matter of fact, cattle on the prairie will deposit their filth and walk away from it. After depositing manure, they will walk away, and that manure becomes a very efficient way of fertilizing the prairie. Uh, in those feedlots, those cattle live in one another's filth and spread disease very effectively to one another. Uh, these uh, factory farm animals also live among uh, tremendous stress. Uh, that is why those birds need to be debeaked, uh, and that is why hogs are routinely having their tails uh, cut off to prevent other hogs from biting them. Hogs, by nature, are very sociable, friendly creatures, believed to be more intelligent than dogs. Uh, for most of human history, when we raised hogs, they actually lived beside people. In old peasant hunts, would live with people. Uh, now they are crammed together, uh, incredibly stressed, violent towards one another, and this is the meat that we eat. Uh, so the animals are being mistreated. In addition, these factory farms are producing concentrated amounts of waste in a way that we've never seen before. These factory farms produce about three trillion pounds of manure and urine a year. That is ten times the amount the humans in the United States are, are, are producing. And there are literally mountains huge mountains of manure outside of uh, some of these feedlots. You saw those lagoons uh, in this children's book I did this year. I had a photograph of a mountain of manure. It looked like a rocky mountain until you looked a little closely. Um, it was millions of pounds of manure, and what was significant about it wasn't how big it was, but the fact that it caught fire. 
uh, because as manure is decomposing, it produces methane. It sometimes spontaneously combusts. This was a huge flaming pile of shit. <laughs> and they couldn't put it out. It was in Nebraska. And it burned for months. Now, we have been raising cattle for millennia, but we haven't had mountains of burning shit. <laughs> now, this manure has become the principal cause of water pollution in the United States. And it's not just um, the bacteria from the manure and the nitrogen that's going into the water, it's also the hormone residues. Because these cattle are not totally efficient in processing the hormones that are being embedded in their ears, and the hormones go into their waste. And scientists are now finding fish downstream of our feedlots that have severely deformed sexual organs because of the high level of hormones in the water. This is a brand new thing. And at the same time, there's been a huge impact on human beings from this system. And I am a great believer, whenever I talk to environmentalists, that human beings are part of our ecosystem and an important part, not to be excluded, uh, but to be protected. There has been a huge rise in foodborne illness in the last 30 to 40 years that has gone alongside the introduction of this industrial system. And you would think that as the latest science and technology is being applied to food production, our food would be getting safer, but the opposite has occurred. And the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention estimates that 76 million Americans are food poisoned every year, and that's probably a conservative uh, estimate. This industrialized system is perfect in many ways for spreading disease far and wide. I mentioned, you know, cattle living in one another's filth is very similar to the, the sanitary conditions of medieval cities when people would just dump their chamber pot out the window into the streets. It was a perfect way to cause epidemics. Uh, the hamburger is a fundamentally new thing, the fast food hamburger. We've been eating hamburgers for generations, but if you bought a hamburger 30 or 40 years ago from a small butcher shop, that one patty probably had pieces of one cow or one steer in it because it was made up from little scraps of leftover meat at the butcher shop. When you get a fast food hamburger today, it probably has pieces of a thousand or more different cattle uh, from as many as five different countries. This is a perfect vector for spreading disease. Well, how does it work? Well, think of it this way. Uh, if you are in a monogamous relationship with your partner for many years, it's unlikely that you will catch uh, a sexually transmitted disease. But if you are uh, exposing yourself to thousands of different partners on a daily basis, well, your odds go up significantly. <laughs> so it matters to you if there are pieces of a thousand different cattle in each one of those little hamburger patties. Uh, if you eat it, make sure it's been cooked really, really well. Uh, this new industrialized system has proven to be an ideal system for spreading newly emerged pathogens, such as uh, E. coli 0157H7, which is spread by cattle fecal material. Uh, it was linked up until recently only with uh, hamburgers. Now it's being linked also to spinach. Uh, in Fast Food Nation, I wrote about how there's shit in the meat. Uh, now there's also shit in the spinach. But there are also entirely new diseases like bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad cow disease, uh, created by the brilliant idea of feeding cattle to other cattle as a cheap form of protein. Again, cheapness and efficiency being the overriding values. Well, we've outlawed the feeding of dead cattle to cattle in this country, but cattle are still being fed cattle blood. Um, cattle are still being fed the waste from poultry slaughterhouses, and poultry are being fed the waste from cattle slaughterhouses. And even more disturbing, uh, the same companies that make poultry feed, like Tyson, also happen to uh, uh, slaughter, uh, slaughter poultry. So one of the principal protein sources being fed to chicken is dead chicken uh, in this country at the moment. This is an attitude towards livestock and an attitude towards consumers that is totally driven by efficiency and cheapness and no other, no other consideration. 
Uh, the other human impact of this system has been an obesity epidemic, an obesity epidemic that has taken hold in precisely the same years as this industrial system, this fast food system, over the last 30 years. And when you look at these fast foods, they are carefully, scientifically designed to taste good and to make you want to eat them again and again. They tend to be high in fat, high in salt, high in sugar, high in calories, low in fiber, low in micronutrients. This is the perfect food to make you unhealthy if you eat it regularly and in large amounts. So as a result, two-thirds of the American people are now obese or overweight. One out of every three American children born in the year 2000, according to the CDC, is going to develop diabetes. Among the children of the poor, one out of every two black and Latino children is expected to develop diabetes. We've seen a doubling in the obesity rate among toddlers and a tripling in the obesity rate among children aged 6 to 11 in the last 30 years. This is an extraordinary cost being imposed on society. A uh, conservative estimate is the cost of obesity in the United States per year is $100 billion a year. Huge cost. And then there's also one other environmental impact of this system, its impact on the land. Uh, every year, 44 billion pounds of synthetic fertilizer are being applied uh, to American soil. And what's also being applied uh, is that manure from those lagoons that is just being spread, spread onto our farmland. And in addition to the bacteria that it contains, it also contains all kinds of stuff like cadmium, lead, other heavy metals, arsenic, which is widely being fed uh, in small amounts uh, to poultry at these factory farms. So essentially, this fast food industrial system has led in a very brief period of time to the contamination of our water, our soil, our livestock, and ourselves. So, what is to be done? Well, one thing I wanna, I wanna comment on. For the last 25 years, we have been preached a gospel of personal responsibility and personal freedom. That is what has been drummed into our head for the last 25 years, personal responsibility. And I believe in that. I believe in personal responsibility and personal freedom. But I, I'm now worried that my own work has stressed that element too much. And this whole idea that every purchase that you make is a vote, and that every purchase that you make has a ripple effect, and that we all must be responsible and ethical consumers. Well, I agree with that. But at the same time, there's a pressure on all of us to be pure, to be morally pure, to think that we're really going to change the world by what we buy. And even in Professor Singer's summation, it, it gets really hard to be pure. It's complicated. Well, should I be buying organic or, or local? Or, or should I, you know, what should I do? The pressure is on us. And I think that what we buy can make a difference and that we are responsible and that we do have an ethical obligation. But I think that changing the world by what you buy is only going to go so far. And it only works to a point. And after that point, I think it's delusion that as consumers, we are going to change this system fundamentally or we're going to change the world. Uh, missing from the discourse missing from the dialogue over the last 25 years have been a couple of other phrases. Uh, one of them is corporate responsibility. And the other one is collective responsibility. And I stand here um, honestly saying that I'm not pure. My purchases are not ideal. And maybe some of you in this room are pure, but it's hard to be pure in this country in the year 2006. But ultimately, the problems that Professor Singer outlined and I've tried to outline are not due to individual faults. They're really not. They have been caused by big systems, system of belief, systems of production, systems of making a profit. And without looking at this from a systematic approach, 
there is no possibility of meaningful change. Each one of us here in this room could go back to the land, move to New Hope, outside New Hope, or you know, find some land in eastern Pennsylvania, grow our own food, and live off the grid. But each one of us living pure isn't going to change this system at all. Uh, if our government doesn't change its policies, if our government doesn't change many of its subsidies, what we do as consumers isn't going to make a profound difference. And I think we cannot allow this movement surrounding uh, ethical eating to focus only on our personal responsibility and on consumer power. Uh, I debated the president of McDonald's in the United Kingdom earlier this year. He seemed like a really nice guy. Uh, this is not about him being a bad guy. There's no, it's not like there are half a dozen bad guys and if we deal with them, everything's going to be all right. Uh, the president of McDonald's UK could be replaced tomorrow afternoon. It's not going to change that company. It's not going to change that system. Uh, the head of McDonald's uh, corporate social responsibility is coming to this conference tomorrow. I really wish that I could have debated him. I guess that's just not to be. No one from McDonald's has ever agreed to appear in public with me in the United States. <laughs> and he is, he is no different. He may be a really nice guy. He may be a really nice guy, but it's not about him. It's about a system that rewards cheapness, efficiency, and speed that has a very, very, very narrow measure of what's efficient and that allows companies like his to impose their business costs on the rest of us. Now, you know, when Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, chemical companies could just dump their chemicals into a stream, and if people were sickened downstream, you know, it's not the, comp the company didn't have to pay for it. And one of the big triumphs of the environmental movement was by forcing these sorts of air polluters and water polluters to assume their external costs, to internalize them and not impose them on society. And I think that's what we have to do with these food companies now. Make them pay for these costs that they're imposing on society. It's very much in the interest of these large corporations to stress the idea of personal responsibility because it gets them completely off the hook. And they can even cite opinion polls of what people want. Well, these personal choices uh, that are at the heart of the business, the heart of their business model, are being made in an environment in which their mass marketing is having a huge impact on what people think of as their personal choices and personal responsibility. I mean, McDonald's is targeting children as young as eight months old, nine months old. This industry is systematically targeting toddlers and young teens and trying to affect people's attitudes and their eating habits literally, literally eight months old. You know, McDonald's and Burger King have done promotions with Teletubbies, which are fictional characters aimed at pre-verbal children or stone college students. So, you know, if you just look, and I'm going to talk about McDonald's a lot because this executive will be here tomorrow and I won't, and I hope some of you will ask him some tough questions. Uh, Fast Food Nation came out in 2001. In the years since Fast Food Nation came out, McDonald's has spent roughly 18 to 20 billion dollars just advertising its food. And I can tell you, my book didn't have a marketing budget anywhere near that size. And I promise you, if you gave me $20 billion, I could probably get people to eat just about anything. So it's, it's very easy to put the onus on people and their choices and their eating habits, but when you're targeting toddlers and spending billions of dollars a year trying to affect their behavior, I think that's a cop-out. Um, the opponents of this system, like Professor Singer, like Professor Marion Nessel, who's here today, uh, like myself, we don't have anywhere near this amount of money at our disposal. But it's remarkable to me how much is changing and how fast it's changing and how these companies are on the run. And I would argue the reason these companies are on the run is they have the money, they just don't have the facts. They just don't have the truth on their side. And they are desperately spinning 
and trying to persuade people they do. The fact that there is even a vice president of social responsibility at McDonald's, to me, is a joke. And he may be a lovely guy. And I hope if you see him tomorrow, you'll ask him things like this, because he's in charge of social responsibility. Is it socially responsible for a company to shut down a restaurant immediately as soon as its workers vote to join a union? Uh, McDonald's has done that on at least three occasions. Is it socially responsible to use private investigators to investigate the critics of your company, to spy on your critics, to harass your critics as they did to the Greenpeace activists in England? Uh, is it socially responsible to continue selling products full of a toxic substance called trans fats? Uh, the Institute of Medicine, a branch of the National Academy of Sciences, came out with a study in 2002 that said trans fats, these cheap industrial fats widely used uh, by fast food chains and particularly by McDonald's, the Institute of Medicine came out with a study four and a half years ago said that these were toxic and that there was no safe amount for human beings to consume. Uh, one study has estimated that 30,000 Americans die every year simply because of trans fat consumption. Another study in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, this spring concluded 200,000, as many as 200,000 heart attacks a year are caused in this country by trans fat consumption. Now, McDonald's said in 2002 it would stop using trans fats. Uh, four and a half years later, it hasn't. And I'd love to ask him tomorrow, well, you know, your public statements say uh, you don't want to change the taste of the French fries, which the trans fats are responsible for, but I've studied McDonald's, and McDonald's is using all different kinds of cooking oils all over the world, and French fries taste pretty good in whatever kind of oil you cook them in. So why is McDonald's no longer using uh, trans fats in Denmark, where they were banned two years ago? And I haven't heard of any McDonald's shutting down in Copenhagen, but for four and a half years have continued to sell this product to most Americans who have been unaware, how many people have died as a result? I mean, in this country, in America right now, if it was a foreign government responsible for 30,000 deaths a year and 200,000 heart attacks and casualties, we would bomb the hell out of them. <laughs> we wouldn't invite them. We wouldn't... We wouldn't praise them for small steps on the road to social responsibility. And, and I would conclude uh, by asking him, is it socially responsible to buy chicken and beef from Tyson and to buy pork from Smithfield Farms, given the fact that Tyson and Smithfield Farms are treating their meatpacking workers almost as badly as they're treating their animals, and that we truly have sweatshop conditions in meatpacking in the United States that Upton Sinclair would have recognized. Uh, McDonald's has spoken a great deal recently about the fact that they're offering apple slices, but to me that's not quite enough. It's not quite enough. And this entire industrial system that you saw the photographs of, McDonald's is at the top of this food pyramid and it has enormous power. I don't think any one company should have that much power, but if it has that much power, it has an obligation to use it in a socially, truly socially responsible way. Uh, your eating habits are not going to change this industry. Uh, the federal government must regulate these businesses. It's 100 years ago this year, not only that The Jungle was published, but that the federal government for the first time declared it would protect consumers from economic, concentrated corporate power, from unethical corporate power. A hundred years ago this year was the passage of the uh, Safe Food and Drug Act, the Pure Food and Drug Act, uh, the Meat Inspection Act, and we need to return the government to fighting on behalf of consumers and not being controlled uh, by a handful of corporations and it's going to require a social movement to get this change. Uh, we had it 100 years ago, we need it again, and that is of the greatest urgency. So I'm going to just conclude by suggesting something you really haven't heard much of uh, in the last 25 years, something about collective action and collective responsibility, and that is this. We are all connected. We really are. And compassion 
is a virtue in the same way that cheapness is. I would say it's a much more important vir virtue and a much greater virtue. And we need a countervailing force against this system, worshiping science, wor worshiping technology, worshiping efficiency, whatever the impact. Um, we have shown in the last 30 years a profound arrogance, profound arrogance before nature in our desire to control nature. That arrogance got us into these problems. It will not get us out. So I think we need to develop a much greater sense of humility before nature. And I'm not advocating a return to horse-drawn plows. I'm advocating a humility before these latest technologies, such as genetic engineering, such as cloning. The USDA this month has approved the sale of cloned animals. For me, that is madness, total madness. We are all connected, whether we like it or not. Animals, people, the land. And I'm going to quote from a botanist who was studying the Dust Bowl in the 1930s who came to this conclusion, who, who said it far more eloquently than I can. This is the botanist Paul Sears in the year 1935, quote, all renewable resources are linked into a common pattern of relationship. We can save any one of them only by measures that save all of them. And we are part of the whole that must be saved. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. As uh, I'm sure the audience has shown you, that uh, was, a, was a wonderful address, given us many things to think about and uh, a forceful way to start off um, the conference. Now, we have a little bit of time for questions and discussion, not a lot. I believe we have some people with roving microphones. So if, um, okay, so the first hand that I've seen is in the middle of that section there. If we can get you a, a microphone before you begin. There's one coming from your other side, sir. Oh, all right. You're in the middle now. Okay. Thank you. No, I don't think so. I can yeah, we, we want to get it recorded. Uh, we can hear you, but we don't think it's going over the microphone. Okay, do that. subject to recriminations, to witch hunts, and so forth. Um, my question, I suppose, then, is, is what role does higher education have, and is it in fact the case that institutions of learning are more part of the problem than they are part of the solution? Uh, I think that they are part of the solution, uh, but when you talk about these land-grant colleges, they are being hugely funded by agribusiness. There needs to be a greater separation uh, between corporate funding and academic research. And I would say exactly the same thing I said today at that college. I've said it to industry people before, and they need to see how it's in their interest. It is in their own interest. Um, I am attacked constantly by the meatpacking industry. I am not vegan. I'm not vegetarian. I still eat meat. I don't eat their meat. I don't eat the meat from this industrial system. And they blame me. Uh, for you know problems that they may be having and yet when you look at why throughout the world no one wants to import American beef and why we have to threaten our trade partners with sanctions 
in order to get them to accept their, you know, their, this product, that's not my fault. And if you're selling a product, ideally, you want people lining up to buy it. You don't want to have to threaten to sue people to buy your product. Uh, in Japan, in Korea, there is great wariness of our beef because of the industrial processes that we use. Uh, I think in the future, American agriculture is not going to be able to compete on the basis of cheapness and, and creating these you know, widespread uniform commodities. And it's, it's really in the interest of these industries to change. And if they don't see it, uh, the government is going to have to really quickly encourage them uh, to do it. Okay, we have, uh, we have another question. Is that lady there? Yes. We, now, we do have the mics working, I believe, now. So if you could get a mic, there's one coming from behind you. Thank you. Thank you for speaking today. <clears throat> Your book actually um, influenced me so much that I started my business with my husband, which is a grass-fed and organic butcher shop in upstate New York. Um, one of the problems that we run into all the time, which you um, talked about a little bit, is that we cannot find slaughterhouses that actually can slaughter the beef or the pork that we deal with. The federal government has been systematically closing down small slaughterhouses, and every time a slaughterhouse has been tried to be built, be built in our area, um, again, they run into problems. Now, we'd love to fight this in some way, but how would you suggest that we go about, you know, changing that? We've got to change the government. I mean, the, the U.S. Department of Agriculture today offers a textbook example of a regulatory agency completely captured and controlled by the industry it's supposed to be regulating. Uh, the chief of staff at the USDA, uh, since uh, President Bush took power, has been the former chief lobbyist for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, which represents the interests of the big meatpacking companies. The idea that one of these mega slaughterhouses in any way produces a safer product than a small local slaughterhouse is absurd. And the USDA's own figures, which are hugely skewed and distorted, uh, show that the larger the slaughterhouse, the more likely the meat is to be contaminated. Uh, New Zealand, which is one of the biggest meat exporting countries in the world, has a, a system of very modern, uh, very, very technologically advanced, small slaughterhouses. And, and that's what we should have in this country as well. But there, you know, there has been industry control of the USDA. And, and we need, not only do we need changes at the USDA, but we need a separate, independent food safety agency that takes the food safety powers away from the FDA, which is woefully underfunded and undermanned, takes the food safety powers away from the USDA, and has a regulatory agency that's that's truly independent in charge of food safety, and, and you'd be able to find a small local slaughterhouse if that were to ever happen. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to use my privilege as, as moderator to follow up a little bit on that yeah. because I wanted to also address what you said about getting beyond simply the ethics of personal responsibility. And I do agree with you that the system needs to change as well. But I'm not really sure how we change this system since essentially the Federal Congress seems so heavily influenced by corporate donations. I mean, we had an interesting example. Probably many of you don't know about it because it wasn't publicized. But when the citizens get to vote on this, they vote the right way. Citizens of Arizona, not the most progressive and liberal state in the country, I, I suppose I could say, citizens of Arizona voted to ban those crates for pregnant sows that I showed you on my overheads um, just at the last election on November the 7th. They voted 62% against those stalls. Um, and Florida, citizens of Florida, again, probably not the most progressive state in the country, um, almost voted for President Bush in 2000. Um, <laughs> citizens of Florida voted by 55% to ban them in 2002. So it seems to me when you can get something before the voters in these states that have this uh, initi initiative mechanism, you can get American citizens to say, no, I don't want that. But when you try and get, you know, if you tried to get a ban on sow crates up in federal Congress, you know, you wouldn't get through the Agriculture Committee. You wouldn't have a prayer of getting well, through it. Well, change starts locally and then just spreads up the hierarchy. And, and I'm optimistic about it. Again, just in the last five, six years, to see the change in attitude among the well-educated and the upper middle class. And when I was at Princeton, I was majoring in American history. 
And that American history that I studied gives me grounds for hope and optimism. A uh, hundred years ago, there was another great muckraking book published called The Treason of the Senate, and it was about the total corruption of the U.S. Congress by corporate money. Uh, deja vu. Uh, but there is a process in this country of periods of incredible corruption and selfishness and greed, and there have been other periods in our history which are marked by more compassion, a greater sense of social responsibility, a greater sense of obligation to one another. And I am a believer that if people knew what was happening, they would want things to be different. And that's why these companies really don't want you to know. And that's why they threaten people like Marion Nessel and myself with all kinds of legal problems just for trying to report on this. So as more and more people become aware, I think you will see changes, but uh, the industry is fighting against them. California has very tough food safety uh, labeling standards, and the response of the U.S. Congress this year was to pass an Orwellian bill called Uniformity in Labeling Act. And uh, what that means is uniformly bad food safety laws. Uh, this was a law meaning that no state could have tougher food safety laws than the federal government. So we need to make these changes at the local level, at the state level, but ultimately we've got to change the federal government. And if that means changing the political culture in Washington and separating these uh, office holders from their corporate money, it has to happen. Okay, thanks. Now, we'll, we're past the six o'clock time, but I think there is so much interest, we'll take a couple more questions. Uh, I don't want to neglect you up in the gallery there, so I see a hand there. Yes, okay. Uh, yes, you. I can't see you very well. Yes. Um, I don't know if they are, they, are they roving mics up in the gallery? Yes. Okay, there's one coming. Just wait a minute, please. We, we are recording and we'd like to get you through the mic. Hi. Uh, I live locally in West Windsor and I've been uh, trying for a, over a year to convince and cajole and change the school lunch program. Uh, it's happening all over the country in places, so it's not my idea, of, of course. But uh, I finally was able to get hold of the newly signed contract with Sodexo, and I have leverage now because our contract has a year grace period for which Sodexo is supposed to deliver whatever it's supposed to deliver before the district signs it for another five years. And I have found out that they doubled the fee for the, for the vendor and that they haven't necessarily promised anything for that. The, the high note is that I was able to convince them before they signed that to get Sodexo to agree to local farms coming into the system. And that's a big thing for Sodexo to allow uh, local produce in. We've had Terhune Orchards, I saw Pam here, Terhune Orchard apples in the uh, school locally. But the problems we're facing are distribution. Why doesn't the D New Jersey Department of Agriculture have a system for local farms to sell to local f schools? I don't get it. I don't get it. And as you said, it's going to take a sea change. It's going to take a lot of people speaking. It's going to take a lot of requests over and over and over and over again. And I asked the business office at our school, can you please give me the contract? And six months later, I finally asked a different person and got it. And it's public knowledge. We're allowed to have this knowledge. The people who run the business offices or the administrators or whatever, you have to speak up and you have to keep going after it. And I'm, I'm pleased because Sodexo is a food buyer and a food mover. They're not a food maker, and that's the problem. Well, good luck. <laughs> I, think, I, I, I think that is an example of the kind of citizen action that we need a lot of people to be taking, and it will all make a difference. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to take one last question, the gentleman in the striped shirt there, if we can get a mic to you. Thank you both very much for a wonderful session. Um, it seems to me that in, in other areas of social concern, one of the things that has allowed um, pressure to be brought to bear on the federal government, talking about systemic change, has been a large and thriving civil society. We see it for animal rights issues, we see it for all sorts of environmental issues. Um, I was wondering if both of you could speak for just a moment on why, despite the fact that human health is at stake, we have not seen the development of civil society in response to some of these issues um, that you've talked about this evening, even though they've been brought to, brought to bear 
publicly for 100 years. I think that I think you see that very movement forming as we speak. I think there really is a movement, and uh, it's you know connected to the environmental movement. It's a sustainability issue. Uh, my God, when you have um, the Republican governor of Arkansas kicking the junk food and the soda out of the schools, and the Republican governor of California doing the same, these ideas are reaching the mainstream in a fashion that, you know, seven, eight, nine years ago, I never, I never expected them to so quickly. You know, the, the, the area where we, we really lack uh, that notion of civil society, I don't think is on these food issues in terms of consumption or even production, uh, because I think that movement is really growing. The thing that's been really frustrating to me over the last five to six years is the lack of inter interest in workers' rights, in the lack of ability to connect what we eat to the people who pick it, process it, prepare it for us. I mean, food is the most important industry. It's the most important thing that we buy. The people who are responsible for bringing us our food really deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. What could be a more honorable thing to do than to prepare food or pick food for, for you? And yet, you know, I, I spent a year investigating the abuse of migrant farm workers. I've spent years now working on behalf of, of the rights of illegal immigrants and meatpacking workers. And that's the part that I just don't see any traction on. And, and that's, you know, you just look at the immigration debate right now. We really need to push ourselves as a, as a society to develop empathy and compassion for the workers at the bottom of society who speak a different language and have a different skin color. So in terms of people being concerned and growing concerned about what they're eating or what their children are eating or what are going to happen to animals, my God, I wish there was an organization on behalf of the poor workers of this country that was half as efficient, half as effective as PETA is on behalf of livestock. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I, mean I, I largely agree with those comments. I think that it is only fairly recently, though, that some of these things have started to emerge. And, for instance, the, the animal movement, which is perhaps of the civil society groups, the ones that I know best, I think have only recently started to become politically savvy. So it was really only in this last election that we saw the, the largest, the humane society of the United States, um, really getting involved in the election, not only in the initiative in Arizona, but also in supporting... Uh, electoral candidates in a few key places where there was a strong difference between them in terms of their support for animal issues. And I think in terms of food issues, environmental issues, those sorts of things are happening. They come together, of course, with movements against rural depopulation because these large corporate farms are, have depopulated rural areas where family farms really don't exist anymore. Um, they're, they're, and that means that small towns don't exist. They become ghost towns because people are not there. So I think there are a lot of organizations now working on this, but they certainly do need to find their common interests, which they can find in the campaigns against corporate uh, agriculture and corporate uh, animal factories. And I think they need to become politically smart at raising these issues. I think then probably we can get the developed civil society that I hope will make these changes. Well, we'll be hearing a lot more about this tomorrow. We have a, f a fantastic array of speakers. I think I, I was really thrilled with all the speakers, starting with, with Eric Schlosser and um, others tomorrow on the list that you can see who did eagerly accept the, the invitations that we issued to come to this conference. So please do come uh, bright and early tomorrow. We want to get a punctual start because we do have a full day. And I look forward to seeing you all again. And thank Eric Schlosser once more. Thank you.